evening and welcome to our Odd Division Speaker Series tonight. We have Brandy Schillis. Um, I'm Emily Thone and I'm the chairperson of the College of Division Student Advisory Board that works with Delta Sigma Chi to put on our College of Division Speaker Series for you. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize all of the members of the College of Division Student Advisory Board. If you could just stand up quick. Everyone in the purple polo is on the, our College of Business Student Advisory Board. Um, so without further ado, I will welcome Dean Murphy. <laughs> Speaking of the College of Business Advisory Board, perhaps you've either, either seen the monitors or a recent email. If you want to tell the dean where to go, I mean what to do, there's an opportunity to apply for the four at-large members of the, of the board. And uh, if you got the email, you should have gotten the application. If you didn't get the email, you can contact Jan in my office and she can get an application to you. But you really do get to advise me. Tell me what you think on that board. I'm hopefully hopeful that the next time we have a speaker, which is April 6th, I'll be able to stand here in front of you and say, you are indeed graduating from an AACSB accredited institution. We've passed the two most important votes as far as I'm concerned. The peer review team came and gave us a positive recommendation. That had to go before the initial accreditation committee of AACSB. It flew through that meeting, and now we're waiting for what's called the rubber stamp of the Board of Directors. I've been assured that's a rubber stamp, but um, I was raised not to count those chickens until they hatch. So once I get that official notice, you'll start seeing the AACSB logo being used on our webpage, and hopefully those, that's going to happen soon, but I know it's probably not going to happen before the end of this week because the last committee meeting is this week. So I'm hoping early April, we'll know for sure, but um, it looked very, very good, folks. So I'm pleased with that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie Opatz to do the introduction. Thank you, Dean. Previously employed in business and finance, Brandy Chalais, assistant professor of English here at WSU, received her master's and PhD from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. At Case, she taught courses on web design, business and technical English for upper division engineers. Her primary focus, however, is 18th century British literature and intersections of pedagogy, literature, and medicine. As part of this varied focus, Brandy is the managing editor for Culture, Medicine, and Psychiatry, an international journal of cross-cultural health research. She also is a board member of the College English Association, a group of teacher scholars primarily concerned with pedagogy. While her teaching interests include rhetoric, composition, Gothic, and 18th century literature, Brandy's current research focuses on obstetrical science in the 18th century. She, she will be delivering lectures in Dublin, Ireland, and Manchester, England this May on medical history topics. Tonight, in the 21st century, She'll be speaking on skills and translation, how to speak across disciplines in a competitive market. Please give a warm call to visit welcome for Dr. Brandy Schilling. Yeah, so shutting them would be awesome. So let me explain. 
explain why. It's not because I'm tech phobic. It's not because I don't like laptops. I love technology. I have three computers. If you Google me, you'll find out I've got blogs and websites and all kinds of stuff. But one of the things that technology does is it's, uh, it, keeps, it gives you something else to look at. So for instance, if you have to take notes, if you have to use your laptop, if you have to have your laptop open, that means you're kind of dividing your attention. And attention is going to be really important for what we're doing in here. But I'll explain why in a little bit. It's, it's like a secret. It's a cliffhanger. You'll find out why we're not using laptops in a minute. But basically, um, I gave you all the notes that you'll basically need. On that sheet, you'll find out that there's places where there's space to write. And I think they gave you all pens, which is really nice. And I think they're probably purple. Almost everything is, uh, including you guys in here. <laughs> There's space to write on here, and there's things that you can fill out, and there's questions that I'm going to ask, and so there is that kind of stuff. But you know what? Your, your notes are pre-made for you already, so you don't have to do it. It's already there. What I'd actually really like you to do is just stay pretty focused, and we're going to be practicing some things in here uh, with our bodies. It's all G-rated, so no worries there. Um, but you will need to stay kind of engaged and, and with me as, as we come along here, so let's We'll try to do that. All right, so paper notes. And paper notes seem so last century, I know, but trust me, this will work out. So first of all, who I am and how I, I got here. He gave the introduction, you might have noticed that I seem to do a lot of different, weird, strange things. It also happens that I paint murals and used to do interior design. Uh, just, you know, why not? It seemed like the thing to do when I was a starving graduate student. So that's one other thing that I've done. All these different bits and pieces kind of help me get a, have, have sort of given me a different perspective on things, as you might imagine. And I'm the editor of a journal, which is great. Anybody want to write papers and get them published? Anyone? Why not? Books get published. Anybody, fiction writers in here, you want to write a novel? Yeah. You do? Okay. What are you doing in here? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're doing, you're, you're here, you're in the College of Business because we don't want to starve to death, partly, partly right? We want to get jobs, we want to understand how to communicate to people out there so that they'll hire us. That's really the bottom line. And uh, we also want to grow as people and do important things and be ethical, but we're probably thinking in terms of graduation. Right? You want to graduate, you want to go out there in the world and do your thing. I went out there in the world with an English degree and ended up working in business and finance, in medical fields, in uh, nursing for a while uh, I did marketing, I was a CFO's assistant, which is strange because English majors by and large can't add. So the fact that a chief financial officer thought I was a good pick was, you know, kind of beyond the pale. I learned how to add really quick though. There's these things called calculators that work really well. <laughs> sort of kept ones, you know, in the desk. Um, but I've done all these things and it's given me a way of seeing the world just a little bit different. In other words, I'm not uh, your typical English major, you know, there's an ivory tower uh, that most of us English majors live in, right? And we write books and we think deep thoughts. Um, but I, I never found it. I'm sure there is one. I can't find it or they won't let me in. <laughs> so instead, I'm, I've approached English and liberal arts and communication in really practical ways. I taught engineers for a number, a number of years, and engineers are very business-minded. They're very interested in the world. And I, engineers are, are, by and large, very idealistic people. And we want them to be idealistic. You know, we want them to care about the should be's of life because they build bridges. And we, they should be like, you know, built in a way that they won't fall down. Uh, when I've translated that to business skills, I find that one of the things that set business majors and engineering majors apart is business majors have an understanding that they're going to be dealing a lot with people. Most of you deal with, yeah, you're, anybody <coughs> surprised by that? You're going to deal with people, customers, or other people in business, or other students, or other colleagues. And, and you tend to get that in ways that sometimes engineers are a little bit surprised by. My old engineering students were like, but I don't like people very much. That's why I'm an engineer. <laughs> and it was always sort of a surprise. You're prepared for that already. The trouble is getting from preparation to delivery. And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today. So because I think it's sort of fair to give you a sense of where we're going, I have a little bit of an agenda here. And this is also on your note sheet. And the first thing we're going to talk about is saying what you mean. Or the problems of making ourselves heard. The problems of making ourselves heard. Uh, point two is quoi? Which is basically <coughs> French for huh? What? Or why and how we misrepresent ourselves. Because we do on a pretty regular basis. Number three is 
lost in translation. It was actually a movie. They copied my idea. Number four is the other language, which I like to call body talk and why Sherlock Holmes is your friend. We'll get to that, don't worry. And last but not least, don't use that tone with me, or the regulations of speaking, writing, tone, and voice. And these are things that we sometimes don't always think about. So I'm going to start off this presentation with what I think is a really, really important lesson, really important point, and that is I am a donut. Does anybody know why I have this up here? Anybody familiar with this story? No? Oh, great. I love this story. Uh, Eddie Izzard. Anybody know who that is? Oh, he's fantastic. He's a lovely cross-dressing comedian. Um, and I was going to actually play a clip for you of him here, but he has a speech impediment. Uh, he actually can't talk without the use of four-letter words. It's tragic. So instead, I'm going to tell you the story because, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to do this is this is college of business kind of thing, right? Uh, I am a donut. Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, John F. Kennedy, who he is, I hope, uh, very, very popular. He goes to Berlin on a tour, and he wanted to sort of give the people of Berlin this idea that we were all one community. Unity, Unity was, was big. And what he wanted to say was, I am like you. I am from Berlin. And does that, that in English, that looks like I'm from Berlin, doesn't it? Pretty much. Ich bin ein Berliner. Unfortunately, it translates as, I am a donut. Two people from Berlin. That's a bit of a translation error. I would say, if you have had translation moments, you know, somebody didn't understand what you said, probably you weren't speaking to an entire country of people. That's problem. Problem. I am a donut. Now, one of the things that Eddie Izzard points out in his co uh, comic skit about, skit about this is that nobody noticed. They went crazy. They were super excited. They were jumping up and down. They were cheering. Why? Why do you think? Thoughts? Yes? Because he stole so well. Yeah. Well, he's John F. Kennedy, by golly, and he's in Berlin, right? Yay, he said something. What was it? I don't know. Yay! Because, according to Eddie Izzard, it's 70% what you look like, it's 20% how you sound, and it's 10% what you say. So he spoke really well. He spoke in that John F. Kennedy way. Um, and people were very excited about it. The problem is, with very few exceptions, no one in here is John F. Kennedy. <laughs> and uh, we have a tendency not to get away with things like that. So mistranslations tend to affect us more, even if our mistranslations aren't in front of an entire nation of people. Um, probably you wouldn't show up and tell a class of people or a prospective employer that you were, you know, a cream stick or something, right? I'm a Blado. You just wouldn't say that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, since we since we know that, we have to take special care of things, and we have to think very hard about how it is that we get heard. So let me just ask a couple quick questions. Um, we've all been misread and misinterpreted at some point in our lives, probably. Um, not being president, in some rare cases, you may have offended a coworker. Anybody offended a coworker before, accidentally? Oh, come on now. Be fair. A friend? Who's offended a friend? A dating relationship? Those are easy, aren't they? <laughs> Why did you say toast like that? Um, what about email? How many of you send an email on a pretty regular basis? Anybody send an email that got totally misunderstood by somebody? Text messages? Oh, yeah, that's, oh, I saw that. Everybody's like, oh, right here. Um, those occasional one-liners don't, don't work, right? It was really funny in your head. And then your friends get back and like, exactly what do you mean by that, huh? Should we have a conversation about this? This is one of those one year significant other goes, we need to talk. So, this translation happens. It's a tone problem, it's a word problem. Have you ever been misunderstood by a professor? Hello, I just had someone stop me. Hi, oh, they left. Uh, anybody been misunderstood by a professor? No? Maybe, kind of? Oh yeah. I love how you guys are all like, not, no, no one else is raising their hand. Oh, good. I'll just hang out down here. Um, don't worry, Auntie, you can give me the wink so we can nod. It's like, oh yeah, I did. <laughs> um, well, the trouble is, it's actually hard to be heard in other ways too. It's not only easy to be misinterpreted, it's actually sometimes difficult for people to hear you at all. 
you're, uh, how many people, I don't know how many people are in here. This is a big classroom. This is, this is big for me. Usually I have small classrooms where I don't need microphones to be heard. Uh, there's a lot of you in here. And right now you all started talking at once. Don't do that. If right now you all started talking at once, I would not be able to hear any one individual of you. Right? So there's a lot of you hanging about. Well, eventually you're going to affect more people in your lives, but you can't affect them unless people can hear you. And if there's a lot of people in this room and you're having trouble being heard by just one, you know, in this room of maybe, I don't know, there's maybe 45 people in here, how do you get heard from a whole school of people? <coughs> how do you get heard in a whole state full of people? Right? Well, I have some statistics up here. According to a recent census, uh, between 19 and 20 percent of Minnesotans have a college degree. And that probably doesn't sound like that much. How many of you think that's a, you know, it's a reasonable number? Well, guess what? It beats New York and California in terms of percentage points. Do you feel good about that? That's right. We have college degrees in Minnesota. Nerds. I come from Ohio. No one has a college degree. I'm just the only one. And I left. Uh, <laughs> we're all getting out. Uh, it's actually true. Ohio is called the Great Brain Drain because people with education tend to leave because there's not a lot of jobs. But uh, basically, this 20% of Minnesotans translates to a, a, a large number of people, about 900,000 people. That's 900,000 people in Minnesota have college degrees. And uh, pretty soon, you're going to be more of them. You're going to add to it. And you're going to have a college degree. But you're going to be one person among 900,000 plus everybody who graduates with you. Um, Anybody start to go, oh, I should have started that goat farm after all. It's kind of, it sounds like depressing statistics, um, but now consider this. This is only one state, so 900,000 people with college degrees in this state, and you're going to go try and get a job not only among them, but among all of the people in all other states everywhere. As I mentioned, if Ohio is the great brain drain and I just left there to come here to get a job, I took one, ha ha! There's other people that are going to do that too. So it starts to get a little bit uh, alarming to some of us, right? We look around and we go, oh, I got the college degree, but, but so everybody seems to have one now. What am I going to do? We're faced with some depressing statistics. Um, I actually put this in your notes. I'm not going to go there right now, but you can go up and check it out or not. It depends on how much you want to cry. Uh, and and it's the, the article is called, You Have a Degree, Do You Have a Job Yet? And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what those unfortunate sort of questions. Right? Oh, you graduated. Do you have a job? It's almost like they're they're like they've got a little dice and they're kind of like, ah, have a job? No. Ah. Uh, we don't like that. But the truth is, don't get depressed. The goat farm option is always available to you. It's always there. Know your goals. I say that partly because halfway through graduate school, uh, when I decided that the dissertation was going to kill me, I thought, you know, an organic goat farm would be great. I started a goat farm, you could have made cheese and wrote like really intellectual things on the wrappers and called it Failed Intellectuals Inc. I think people would have been into that, like, you know, like the, the mass activity of goat eating a diploma or something. I didn't go that route, so. But you should know your goals, you should figure out what it is that you really want in life. <coughs> Don't get upset, get prepared. Get prepared. So, in other words, the problem with the herd is that there's a herd, H-E-R-D, there's a herd out there, there's a whole bunch of people. And I like Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam Chomsky has a tendency to refer to most people in the world as uh, the bewildered herd, which doesn't actually win you friends and influence people, as it turns out. But there's some things that we can learn from it. There's some lessons. When I worked in the business and finance world, one of my jobs was to pour through resumes, and we got tons of these things. You had one job opening, all of a sudden, like people you didn't know existed came out from everywhere, all wearing the same suit and like that tie, you know, that you've seen before. You all, you all shop at the same place. Right? They come in, it's hard to tell them apart. So they, you would have this stack of resumes, right? And I would get maybe 100 in a week. And my job, my boss would come to me and say, here are 100 resumes. And I only want to look at 10. Make 90 of them go away. And one of the ways I did that, actually, had to do with how they wrote. Did they spell things right? Did they misspell, oh yeah, do you misspell the company's name or the president's name? That's bad, that's dirty pool right there. That's a bad mojo, you're in trouble. <clears throat> Misspelling, went file 13. Uh, comma errors, grammar errors, file 13. In other words, the key to getting a job in the business world actually became, at least on that first doorstep, 
How did you communicate yourself? What did you say? And, uh, you know, that a good 10 out of 100 made the first cut, and that was before we even had interviews. And this is kind of how a lot of this works. So the herd, H-E-R-D, is huge. So this is a big lesson, right? It's big, and we have to compete against the herd. But here's the kind of good news. Most of them actually are not very effective communicators. Most of them actually aren't very good at selling themselves or at communicating what they've got to offer. So if you can get good at it, that means that you, it's like you just become the giraffe in the herd, right? You're like, stick, oh, I see somebody with a really long neck, you know? I see that guy, I see him, I see that girl, I see her. So one of the things that I've learned about this is that a state, <coughs> excuse me, a way to stand out from the herd is to be a good communicator. And that's exciting to a certain degree, um, the why, the what, and the how of skill building is the next step. You've heard people tell you to communicate well. How many people have sat down and told you how to actually do it? Right. Write better. And you're like, okay, what's the next step? Well, it turns out the better you communicate, the more you can stand out, and most people don't tell you how, and my job today is to tell you how. So this is good. This is good news for you. I want to talk to you about how do you become the person who stands up out of the crowd, who actually gets noticed. Probably some of you have jobs already. How many people have jobs right now? Good. Internships? I don't know if you guys do internships. Good, okay, a couple of people have internships. How many of you already know exactly what kind of career you want? You're, oh good, about like all four of you, five. Um, yes, because, right, we're not sure. We have jobs, we're not sure if they're the jobs <coughs> that we want to get. Does anybody have a job right now that is their dream job immediately? Like, do you have, no, yeah. You don't count. <laughs> I have my dream job right now, too. Um, but the point is, how do you get it? You kind of know what you want. So if you saw a lot of hands, I think I know what I want. I'm working right now. I, I'm pretty sure I know where I want to go. Getting there can be kind of difficult. And as you probably already started to realize, right, it's kind of a your, your it's step process. You take a step, you take another step. You get to know this person, you get to know someone else. You move on in the industry. And I know you've already had a talk about networking, which is great. Well, before we can talk about how to go right, we kind of have to address how we go wrong. So why and how we misrepresent ourselves. <clears throat> Earlier, I asked if any of you had been misunderstood before. Of course you've all been misunderstood. I know this because you were all teenagers. And all teenagers are misunderstood. Some of us more than others. You know, I felt it was necessary to wear a lot of black. <laughs> Maybe I'll still have no ex-goths in here. I, I admit it. It happens. I've been there. I teach Gothic literature now, though, so I feel like I was uh, researching. <laughs> it works now. So, <laughs> so I asked you, um, but I'd like to be more specific, and I actually kind of want your input. And there's extra points for enthusiasm, by the way. So not only do I want you to participate, but there should be like smiling and jumping. Uh, well, smiling and nodding. Awesome. Yeah, that's what it's actually. Oh yeah, it's matter she's got really good music in right now. <laughs> Great. Okay, so what I want is a show of hands. Um, the number of people who raised their hands earlier who said yes, they have been misrepresented or misunderstood at some point. Back up the air. Okay. All right. Great. Oh wow, lots more. See, this enthusiasm worked out. All right. Now, um, sorry, hands back up. Sorry, I gotta make sure where you are. Okay. Uh, great. Scarf with blue right there. Um, give me an example. Text message, okay, with uh, bad consequences? No, it's just like how you say something if you're short, so I call you mad. Oh, yeah, people think that you're mad, okay. Uh, greenish, bluish, nice jacket you think, text. Me. So it's saying something like this. W were you texting each other? No. <laughs> okay. Don't, because you'll misunderstand. Okay, other, show of hands again. All right, somebody give me another situation. What about you? Okay, so she, she had a problem with word connotation. She said one word and they were all like, what? I'm not going to ask for the word because, you know, you never know where it might be. Some of you might go, what? All right, good. Text messages. Anybody not uh, have been misheard? Yeah. Uh, well, I have in a joking way said something and it was misunderstood. Mm, how many people have had a joke gone wrong? Oh, yeah, we were among friends. <laughs> we were among friends. I've had that too. And then does it help? And you're like, well, I was just kidding. I was just kidding. And then they hit you, right? <laughs> no. All right, another situation where you've been misunderstood or mis 
misrepresented, how about misrepresented by one person to someone else? Has anybody ever misrepresented you on your behalf? Well, she said you were mad. to tell mom and dad uh, what you said in a different way. That's still, I'm an adult, it still happens. Your brother said that you said that this is, uh, don't listen to my brother, I know. <laughs> right, anyone else been misrepresented to someone else? Somebody just totally, oh I thought you liked her. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> sorry. It happens, okay, another show of hands. How many of you have, we already talked about text messages. What about email? How many of you have had an email, uh, like an email letter that you sent to somebody get completely misunderstood, become sort of a catastrophe? Yeah? Tell me about it. Um, I had a roommate talk about using his mom, who's an attorney, as a reference, and when he mentioned the word attorney, our landlord freaked out. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that always worries me about the landlord. When the landlords get nervous about police and attorneys, it's like, wait. Um, I had to email a teacher once about an incomplete grade that I had, and he felt like I was rushing him when I emailed him, so he got he snapped at me. Ah, uh, yes. Anybody had uh, that sort of teacher top-down effect? I am a teacher. I know I've done it. I've been like, don't you take that tone with me. I've, we'll, we'll get to that one. <laughs> right? I'm a teacher. I get paid for this. Okay, uh, last question. Anybody ever had a gesture misunderstood, like a physical gesture, body language? Yeah, okay, hands, anybody? People are less willing to admit this one, right? Tell me about it, what happened? Oh yeah, <laughs> you're right in the middle here, you can see.
um, body language, all these things are ways in which we miscommunicate, usually because we're just not thinking about it. It's just not thinking about it. You're not thinking about you know, how you sit, how you stand. Are any of you thinking about how you're sitting right now? Look around real quick before everybody changes their postures. Okay, we've got some mirrors. We've got some chinners. We've got some people going, look at the pen. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. But think about it. Like, how do you sit? Have you ever actually been working on a paper or something and then realized halfway through that you're really sore because you've been sitting in some bizarre, like, Igor like position and you didn't even know it? Does that happen? Is it just me? Come on. No, it's you too. Okay, there's two of us. It's great. <laughs> right in the answer. Um, right now, see if you can sit, just sit a little straighter for a minute. Do you feel different? Like, oh yeah, I have a, I have a spine. I forgot all about that. And, and we all feel like the need to stretch, and it's good, right? It feels like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm getting some stretches now. I'm feeling happy again. But we don't often think about how we're sitting or how we're standing. We don't often think about our body language, our eyes, our, our contact. Um, this is true of the way we write, too, of the words we use.
But unfortunately, they don't need you all at once, most of the time. You've got to give them layers of yourself at a time. So you have to get really good at doing all the layers really well. This is part of what I call putting it together and taking it apart. Because one of the most valuable skills we have as human beings is pattern recognition. We see patterns. You've been doing it since Sesame Street and Go Fish, right? That looks like that. They go together. So I need some volunteers. I need seven or eight people to come down here. Not afraid of me. I promise I won't bite. Seven or eight people to come down here. Come on, everybody. Come on down. They're just get up and come down. Come on. There's one. There's another one. You in the back with the M. You just look like you need to be down here. Come on down here. I see, uh, let's see, green and black right there. Yay, come on down. Oh, you smiled. That's good. All right. Uh, turquoise shirt thing that I like. Come down here, too. Right, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. I need two more people. Two people from the back. I can't see that far. Come on. Show me you love me. Go on down. That's a scarfy person. Come down here. Just good scarfiness. I like scarfy. Good. Chai man. Blue chai man. Right here. Come on up here. Okay. <laughs> Who's that? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> I didn't want to make you wear a funny hat to differentiate you. Okay, great. Oh, good. We've got a good set around here now. All right. There's sports, actually. All right, so here we go. I'm going to make some arrangements here.
need to, and the people are only getting bits and pieces of our information at a time. The job, the, the way we become really effective translators and really effective communicators is that we're paying attention to those bits all the time. We're not losing track of what's going on. We're really, really aware. Okay. So here we have here some modules that I want to talk about. The introduction. Okay. The introduction. Let's assume that you are actually going on your job interview and uh, you're meeting with people. Well, there are some several things that feed into the module introduction. One of them is the letter. One of them is your cover letter. That's a bit that feeds into that. One of them is your resume. Your resume is another piece that they see of you, not the whole picture, right? And they probably see it before they meet you. The phone call, right? Because usually they call you to say, yes, we are going to give you an interview. And you, you know, you want to sound like a competent, you know, like, what? You know, right? You want to sound competent and hireable on the phone. So that's another bit that they have of you. Uh, the greeting, when you walk into a place, sometimes you're greeted by a staff, sometimes you're greeted by a secretary or uh, another colleague or something like that before you actually sit in the interview, and that's a place where they're getting bits of your personality. Your appearance, oh yes, your appearance matters, it truly does. Um, your handshake, how you shake hands, it, ma it matters, right? It's a piece of your, whoa, oh, lost that thing. <laughs> uh, it's a piece of your personality, and they're only getting a part of it. And you have an opportunity to make this really good as long as you're focusing on not making those errors that we talked about before. So again, remember the whole like gruff face, drop the keys, kicking the bucket, kind of, well don't kick the bucket, kicking the whatever kind of thing. Um, that gives them the wrong impression. So if you stub your toe right before you walk in for the interview and you have that horrible grimace on your face, they're gonna read things into it. So these are bits, these are the first bits that they get of you. Okay, here's some more. The body, and notice I've constructed this the way essays are constructed, introduction, body, conclusion, because we're all aware that that's how things go. That's going to come back later, because this is a kind of narrative. Uh, the body of this has several pieces in it too, written material. So for instance, um, sometimes they'll ask for a kind of portfolio sample essay or something. It depends on uh, what kind of job interview or what kind of situation it is. The web page, video or blog, how many do you have a web page? How many of you have a, a web presence of some kind? How many of you are on LinkedIn? Oh, that's good, yes. Uh, a blog, do they have a blog? They're free, they're easy to construct. I mean, these are other parts of your personality. Uh, video introductions to yourself. That's part of the body, another bit of you. Bit, bigger bits here, right? This is just like in a real paper, the introduction is short and the body is sort of hefty. The stuff going on here is more pieces of you. You're seeing more of you at a time. The interview Q&A, and when I say Q&A, I actually mean Q&A. I don't mean just their questions to you. I mean your answers back, and I mean the kind of questions you ask them, because that's important. What kinds of questions you ask back do you show that you're interested? Right? That's part of the body of communication. Um, <clears throat> your body language, sit, sit, right? Uh, and what I mean by that partly is, you know, there's different ways of sitting. There's kind of like the, that doesn't look very competent. <laughs> There's the slouchy, there's the, the sort of like way on the edge of your seat. There's all different ways that we can sit. Um, so the sitting part is important. Then there's the conclusion, which includes any follow-up materials. If you're lucky, they'll ask you, you know, like, hey, could you send us something else? Could you send us more? Um, it includes uh, the follow-up thank you email that you might send or a follow-up phone call that you might make. <clears throat> a graceful sign-off and the actual physical bodily exit. Okay, when you get up to leave the room, not missing your chair, for instance, or something along those lines. Um, he was helping me out. <clears throat> That's what that was about. Well, if you notice here, what I've actually done, if I can go back, is some of these things look different. There's some that are underlined, some that are italicized, some that are regular. And the reason is they're actually part <clears throat> of different things. Letter, resume, written stuff, web page, follow-up materials, all written. Phone call, greeting. Interview Q&A, follow-up call, all verbal. Handshake, appearance, body language, the physical exit, all non-verbal bodily skills. Oh man, we're learning those. So lots of translation is the next thing. Everybody seen that movie? It's kind of fun. It's actually kind of terrible, but anyway. <clears throat> Skills and translation exercise. Now, this is something you're going to do on your own rather than, than here. So I'm teaching a class right now called Romancing the Marketplace, and several of my students uh, are actually here. I see a couple of them. And 
one of the things that we've been doing there is we've been talking about the skills we already have. We have a lot of skills. The trouble is communicating those skills in an effective way. So one of the things that we did in class, we had a game where they actually came up with a particular set of skills they already had, like, I like to play guitar. You know, I like to talk to people. I read books, that kind of thing. And then we talked about, what do you turn them into so that people understand them? Not, I like to read books, but I'm a careful reader. I'm a critical thinker, right? Do you understand? There's ways of translating your skills so that they mean something to a particular industry. Um, I like people. I'm good at customer facing, right? Sounds good, doesn't it? Part of this language, you have valuable skills. You have to be able to get them from one part of the dialogue to another part of the dialogue. So that if you're interviewing with a company that does pharmaceuticals, it, you know, you're going to communicate in a particular kind of way. If you're interviewing in a company that sells widgets, you're going to communicate in a different kind of way. If you're interviewing for graduate school, again, a third and totally different way. This is really where the translation happens, and unfortunately, the best way to do translation is actually just to practice it, where you will make a list. You should make a list of the skills you know you possess, things you actually like to do. Do you like to draw? Are you artistic? How can you translate that into a skill that actually works in a particular business? Everything that you do matters. All the bits matter. All the bits help us be the whole person. Well, Rather than going through and doing that in here, I'm instead going to talk about three ways that you can do it really well. Assessment, narration, and translation. Now, this is Sherlock Holmes and Watson. How many of you know who that is? OK, but I'm not talking about that Sherlock Holmes and Watson. I'm talking about that Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Sherlock Holmes and Watson, this is why they're your friends. Uh, great detective of all time. Everybody usually knows who he is. He's kind of fun and fantastic. And uh, you know, one of the things that they're really well known for is that Sherlock Holmes is very, very perceptive, right? How many of you have read a Sherlock Holmes story or have at least seen one of the adaptations in some way? Okay, you know who he is, <coughs> kind of a cultural icon, right? He's very perceptive, knows what's going on. Guess what? Based on a real human being. He's actually based on a doctor. <clears throat> uh, let's see. I have his name written down here somewhere. Dr. Joseph Bell is a surgeon that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle trained him. And he was phenomenal because what he would do is he would diagnose people when they walked in the room. And he'd also tell them what they had for breakfast. He was sort of fantastic. He could just look at the things about the person and figure them out. And that's really effective. Because assessment means breaking things down into smaller pieces and really being very observant. So did you ever think that reading a bunch of things and a bunch of articles and being able to process them and shrink them down would be effective? It is in the business world because observation and the ability to break things down and assess them is incredibly, incredibly important. <coughs> the other problem, though, is you have to communicate the skills that you have assessed. So for instance, I've been walking around and talking in front of you the entire time, and I have been uh, standing in particular ways. And I wonder, I could probably ask you right now if you could remember, what kind of, what are my characteristic hand gestures? How have I been looking at you? <laughs> Giraffe? Right, good one, good one. Um, very nice. What are some of my characteristic statements? How do I use my voice? You've been watching this. I've been aware of it the whole time. And guess what? I've been watching your body language, too. I've been observing all of you from the time you walked in the room. I've been watching to see how you sit, how you stand, how you smile, how you... Do you know each other? Do you nod? Do you laugh? Do you blink? Most of you blink. Most of you blink when I said that. It was just kind of interesting. Uh, do you yawn? Um, right, so I'm checking things out, I'm checking the room, I'm looking in the back, I'm looking in the front, I'm trying to find out, where's your interest? Are you engaged? So I'm wrapping this back around again, remember? Are you engaged? Are you paying attention? How am I engaging with you? Am I keeping your interest? Am I letting you feel part of the discussion? Do you care about what I'm saying? I only know that if I watch your body language, and that part is assessment, and that's the Sherlock Holmes model, right? Sherlock Holmes going around, evaluating things. There's a problem with Sherlock Holmes, though. Sherlock Holmes is an utterly unemotional character. And the problem with not being very emotional is that uh, it also, like Noam Chomsky, does not win you friends and influence people. So, if your audience is hostile, are they tired? Are they irritable? Is it 7 o'clock at night and it's pouring outside? Right? Are there things you need to know about them? Are they bouncy? Are they loud? Are they formal or informal? Who are they? Where are they from? You can find that out the Sherlock Holmes way, but unfortunately, Sherlock Holmes isn't necessarily going to reach out and touch people. 
He's not the narrator of the story. It just so happens that all of these Sherlock Holmes stories are written by Watson, because Watson is the storyteller, and that's where narration comes into play. Narration is more important than just telling a good story. Uh, it's, more, it's, it's beyond the cocktail hour, right? It's, it's beyond just hanging out with your friends. Tell a story to your employer. I don't mean tell a story. I don't mean like, so, two goats walk into a bar. I don't mean that. I mean, tell your story, right? You have to narrate your skills. Narrate yourself. So you assess the situation. You find out what kind of people am I talking to. Then you Watsonize yourself, and you figure out, how can I tell the story? How can I share with these people? So the rules. Quickly assess the room and the people. Adjust your <coughs> attitude to the circumstances. Decide which direction and which atmosphere you want the room to take. I'm going to talk back to Eddie Izzard. He talks about uh, warm and cold, like in the shower, right? The perfect shower temperature is not here or here. It's between here and here. <laughs> Subtle shifts. If the room seems too formal, too stuffy, too cold, they're not interested, don't let their attitude affect you. Let your attitude affect them. Bring the warmth. <coughs> bring the sunshine, right? If your audience is already super bouncy and crazy, you're talking to 12-year-olds or something, don't let their attitude affect you. Bring the calm. You have to be Watson to do this. You can't be Sherlock. Sherlock assesses, Watson figures out how to adjust, and then how to tell the story. So that's partly how we do it. But lastly, there's translation involved. And the translation is that you have to be able to talk to them with those correct words. So those three keys, you guys, are really invaluable. Can you assess who you're talking to? Can you make a list of your strengths and translate them into a language that they find useful and interesting? Can you be Watson? Can you narrate yourself? Can you be all that caring? Watson was a pushover. He was the emotional sugar daddy guy, right? Can you be soft in that way and still be Sherlock at the same time? This is a very important skill. It's a good balance, too. And finally, tone. Your mother was right. Tone matters. Tone and voice is a lot to do with breathing and body. Funny thing, everything seems to have to go back, right? That they're all interconnected. What you say are your words. How you say them is your tone. You use your body to do it. We talk much more effectively when we stand up straight. When we think about our voice being coming from inside us to out, how many of you find that like you, there are moments where you lose your voice, where you get freaked out, you know, you're getting ready to give a big presentation, you're on a first date, all of a sudden you're like, I got, I got, I got. Right. It happens. It happens. <coughs> and one of the reasons that it happens is because our bodies react when we're under stress. So the reason I told you that I wanted us all to be engaged, that I wanted you not to use laptops, and that I wanted you to think about how you were sitting, is your body is a big factor in all of these things. The writing that you do is going to be translated by the person that you are. So when you go to interviews, when you are communicating in writing, when you are translating your skill sets, you have to be the whole person. And you have to think about that whole person idea. And that includes how you breathe, how you stand, being aware of your gestures and your body language, and translating that inside to the writing. In other words, visualize the tone of your emails. Visualize the tone of your text. Say them out loud. If you can say them in a nasty way, maybe you should rewrite them. <laughs> right? So it's all related, and that's the one thing that I think most of us miss. So tone, great. <coughs> now you're loud, now what? That means you have to move beyond it. Writing and tone, great. Now you can speak, now what? You have to put it together. Assessment, written, oral, and nonverbal. Narration, written, oral, and nonverbal. We tell a story with our hands, too. Translation, written, oral, and nonverbal. Because basically, to get all your bits translated in this very competitive realm in which we live, you have to learn how to be a whole person on paper. You have to learn how to be a whole person when you speak. And you have to learn how to be a whole person in the way you move and interact and look and care about your people that you're talking to. Like, I actually care about all of you. Um, I do. I want you to be interested. I want you to be here with me. And that translates in ways to your audience. And it will translate. If you go to a job interview and you don't really want to be there, chances are you can accidentally misrepresent yourself by translating that, by giving them a sense that you're not really into it. So basically, writing in tone, think of all the ways that you might not come across right. Be Sherlock, be Watson, 
Don't be JFK. Don't be a donut. Don't be George Bush. Don't accidentally, you know, rip off your employer, things like that, or a whole country while you're at it. Right? Be Sherlock, be Watson, assessment, narration, translation. And I promise you that you will be heard above the hurt. Thank you.